from a novel that Beckett wrote during the Second World War, when he was on the run with his wife, or his soon-to-be wife, and they were hiding out in the Vaucluse in Roussillon. Uh, Samuel Beckett was in the, um, the French Resistance, and while Paris was occupied, was in the business of carrying and translating messages from the French Resistance when his cell was um, discovered, and they had to flee. So, himself and his wife, and this is where a lot of, say, if you've seen the play Waiting for God, or this is where the topos of Waiting for God comes from. Two people beside a tree, waiting, suspicious of anybody else who's coming, not knowing when they're going to be rescued. What is the most extraordinary novel? It's 340 pages long. It's mad. And as though Simon Beckett decided, he said afterwards, he never imagined that he would see out the war. He didn't imagine that he would live. And he thought that he didn't have the time, he didn't have the comfort, because they were literally moving from barn to barn at night, and he was writing on the back of pieces of paper and on leaves. He didn't have the comfort to sit down and write an opus magnus. So he thought, I'll just write something mad. These people will say, maybe it's the craziest novel ever written. It is, but it's great. Here's another example. What, and it's about what? It's about a Mr. What who goes to live and work in the house of a Mr. Not which is a very extraordinary place. That opposition, that clash of opposites I'm talking about, consider this, what smile? What smile was further peculiar in this, that it seldom came singly, but was followed after a short time by another, less pronounced, it is true. And it even sometimes happened that a third, very weak and fleeting, was found necessary before the face could be at rest again. But this was rare, and it will be a long time now before what smiles again unless something very unexpected turns up to upset him. <laughs> Within moments, a Mr. Spiro turns up and says, Hello? What smiles? No offence, said Mr. Spiro. <laughs> in Watt's house, in Mr. Knott's house, Watt, one night, goes down to try and make himself some porridge. He's hungry. He's in the kitchen, presumably he's in the kitchen, but you're reading the book. He's looking for a pot in which to boil the porridge. He finds something, what? Finds something in Mr. Knott's kitchen that might be a pot. Looking at this pot, or thinking of this pot, thinking about Mr. Knott's pots, of one of Mr. Knott's pots, it was in vain that what said pot, pot. Well, perhaps not quite in vain, but very nearly. For it was not a pot. The more he looked, the more he reflected, the more he felt sure of that, that it was not a pot at all. It resembled a pot, it was almost a pot, but it was not a pot of which one could say pot, pot, and be comforted. <laughs> now thankfully, when he returned from the war, he stopped short of this complete deterritorialization of language, and continued to exercise at least the pretense of story and event. Further, in increased amounts after the war, he emphasized the constructiveness and artificiality of the ideologies that tried to oppress the disenfranchised. He had this brought home to him a magnified degree while on the run during the Second World War, while returning to Paris after the Second World War and realized that all of his Jewish friends had died in concentration camps. For example, Beckett characters frequently do not know who they are, so they find themselves seeking ways to bring meaning to their lives. Further, because they are neither one thing nor the other, never home, always away, they explore poles of being and often incorporate both in ways that other people who imagine themselves to be singular never consider, or only do so fearfully, as though the idea of ourselves contradicting ourselves would somehow undermine us. Malloy, a tramp who is seeking his way home but never finds his way home, um, sorry, I got distracted there. Malloy, uh, the novel Malloy by Samuel Beckett is a tramp who apparently is trying to find his way home. He is trying to return to his mother. But every time he thinks about the possibility of returning to his mother, he is appalled. On the way, he encounters a woman called Lex, or at least he runs over her dog, a Pomeranian, on his bicycle. And he has to hang around for the funeral. <laughs> but what was my contribution to this burial? It was she dug the hole, put in the dog, filled up the hole. 
On the whole, I was mere spectator. I contributed my presence, <laughs> as if it had been my own burial. <laughs> the dog had ticks in his ears. I have an eye for such things. They were buried with him. When she had finished her grave, she handed me the spade and began to muse or brood. I thought she was going to cry. It was the thing to do. But on the contrary, she laughed. It was perhaps her way of crying. Or perhaps I was mistaken and she was really crying with the noise of laughter. Tears and laughter. They are so much gay to me. So here you have the idea of the opposition being collapsed in the notion of an Irishness which he has already jettisoned, he has already given up on. Here's Malloy's take on the notion of love. They love each other. Marry in order to love each other better, more conveniently. He goes to the war, he dies at the war. She weeps, weeps with emotion at having loved him, at having lost him. Yet, marries again in order to love again. You love as many times as necessary, as necessary in order to be happy. He comes back from the war. <laughs> he didn't die at the war after all. She goes to the train station to meet him. He dies on the train at the thought of seeing her again, having her again. She weeps again with emotion again at having loved him and having lost him. Yep, goes home. He's dead. <laughs> the other is dead. He hung himself with emotion at the thought of having had her, at the thought of having lost her. There's the story. They taught me to teach me the nature of emotion. What emotion can do given favorable conditions. That's emotion. That's love. Well, well. <laughs> Finding himself alone in the countryside, Malloy also tells us it's like intertextual and draws attention to the body, the idea of the body politic. In winter, I use newspaper to reinforce my great coat and keep me warm until the earth rose again for good in April. The Times literary supplement was admirably suited to this endeavour, being of an unfailing toughness and impermeability. Even farts made no impression on it. <laughs> I'm sorry I mentioned it, but gas escapes my fundament so often I have to mention it sometimes, however great my distaste. Once I counted 315 farts in 19 hours, <laughs> an average of over 16 farts an hour. After all, it's not excessive. 15 farts every hour, it's nothing. Not even one fart every five minutes. Damn it, I hardly fart at all. I shouldn't have mentioned it. Amazing how mathematics helps you to know yourself. <laughs>